Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Dr Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. In today's episode, I'm exploring the question, how can schools take a trauma-informed approach post-pandemic with head teacher Stuart Guest? Stuart has over 13 years experience as a head teacher and is a father of a birth child and two adopted children. He's developed trauma-friendly approaches at his school and has seen the positive impact this can have on pupils, families, staff and outcomes for the school. I've brought this episode forward in my schedule as I couldn't wait to share it with you. Listen to the end, where Stuart's closing thoughts left me lost for words and with a massive lump in my throat. Enjoy the show. I'm Stuart Guest. I'm the head teacher of Colborne Primary School in Birmingham. Um, and I've got two adopted children and a birth daughter as well. And we are a trauma-informed school and we have been for quite a few years. Um, and we try to do the best that we can for our children, particularly those with additional needs. And how much of what you do and your drive as a trauma-informed school is informed by your personal experience? Because as a fellow parent of both a biological and an adopted daughter, I mean, I'd assume it would inform it quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think over the last sort of 12 years plus, um, my learning has, has, has rapidly grown. Yeah. Um, but also I've got a, a really great team of staff, and um, particularly members of my leadership team, my, my assistant head for inclusion, who is trauma informed. Yeah. So I've got people around me that are like minded, that have been able to challenge me, me challenge them. Um, to have a collective and understood approach to being trauma informed because it can't be one person it's got to be everyone absolutely so it's kind of driven by a, a, a personal passion and your your personal life but then uh, very much with your professional hat on you've got that, that team who are fully on board and just kind of backstepping because we never know who's who's going to listen in and many people who are listening in trauma informed will be part of their kind of common vernacular but for some people it won't be so can you just explain what what does it mean to be a trauma informed school and why does it matter absolutely for me it's it's to start with it's about knowledge it's about learning for staff about what trauma means the impact that can have on children um, how to support them their coping mechanisms and the therapy mechanisms so that's the first part for me it's understanding what it actually means and the impact the trauma can have on children and then for me the next stage is about the whole policies and procedures okay so what needs to change within a school setting mm-hmm. that reflects the knowledge that you've now gained and, that, and that's critical that's things like behavior rewards sanctions approaches um, the type of staffing you have all that and then it goes into the provision okay what does it look like in the classroom what does it look like when a child is really struggling what does it look like at the start of the day what does it look like at dinner time and transition points so it, it moves from the knowledge then making sure your policies reflect that and then into the actual practice and what you see on the ground for the children and what do we mean by trauma I think people need to understand the two main different types of trauma. You've, you've got that trauma that's, that's an acute incident, a car crash or, you know, something like that. And then you've got that ongoing trauma that's repeated over a long period of time that physically changes the body and how you react to things. And it's those understanding those two different traumas that are really important because they need different type of provision in schools. So what I do a lot of work on is that ongoing trauma. So those children that have had difficult starts in their lives, who are already in the home life, but it isn't great, and they're not getting the nurture and the care they need, that's going to impact on them. Um, So it's about understanding what that might look like for them. And then if they are hypervigilant or if they're very short-fused and reactive, why that might be and what we can then do to help. And you're saying that this kind of approach sort of finds its way into all that you're doing. So it's right there at the high level in your kind of in your in your policy and how you approach everything. And then obviously it must be playing out in your practice day to day. Could you give me an example? So if we took behavior, what would a trauma informed approach to behavior look like? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's, it's a few key things. One, when you see a child, say, being disruptive, for example, let's say in a classroom. Yeah. Okay, a trauma-informed view would be, okay, I can see that child is struggling. I wonder what's going on. 
what's the best way to support them? Okay, a non-trauma informed way is they're causing me trouble, they need to be out of my room. Okay. okay? And I think it's those two directions that behavior policies can go in. Yeah. You know, it, it's, the, it's the more punitive, the isolation, or just get out of my room, you're disturbing others, they, they've got a right to learn, that type of approach. And actually, okay, what is this saying? Is it saying that they're just having a really difficult morning, something's gone on? Or is it actually saying my teaching's not very good today and they're getting bored easily? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's that being really reflective and, and thinking, okay, what, what, is this, what is this telling me and what do I need to do? That's quite hard though, isn't it? If you've got a kid kicking off in your class and you've got 29 other kids to teach as well and maybe they've got your back up because, I mean, regardless of what might have caused that, that's hard, no? I mean, how, how, do, oh, how do you do that? It's completely hard, but this isn't just you drop a trauma-informed approach onto a class, go. It's embedded through our, our culture okay. and, and how we talk to children, how we greet children. You know, you know if we see that child struggling in, in, a, in a lesson, the teacher won't berate them and shout at them. They will go over and go, James, I can see you struggling today. Okay, maybe I, you're struggling with the work. What, do, what is that right? You know, it's that inquisitive, you know, approach. I'm yeah. curious about what's going on here. And would you know what? We're going to do this together. And it might be they need to come and sit with you as a teacher, but that's not a punishment. It's me saying to you and you to the child, I care about your learning. I want you to do well. And I'm going to help you here. We're in this together. Yeah. You know, that, it's, that, it's just compassion. It's care. Knowing that these kids, you might not know half of what's going on in their lives, but, you know, we can still be there for them. So to kind of extrapolate from that, then, if a trauma-informed approach where we're kind of curious about sort of challenging behaviour we might see is really about caring, does that mean that the kind of the more traditional approach that perhaps is what we might see more in the directive down from DfE and so on, is that not caring? I think each school has to make its own decisions about what they think um, is in the best interest of their children. Mm -hmm. If they have the knowledge of being trauma informed, if they understand the difficulties these children have at a deeper level, so they've got the knowledge yeah. and then they make those decisions, then I would say they're informed decisions. Yeah. However, what worries me is that some of those decisions are being made without the knowledge of the impact of trauma on children. And therefore, those decisions are based on wrong information. And could they be traumatising in themselves, those things that we end up doing? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about some, you know, the, the whole names on boards, you know, and stars on the board and stuff like that, it's just shame-based approaches. And, and people do them in, in, in best, best interest. They're thinking, you know, this is what I'll do, but this is what we've always done. But actually, if you go back and unpick them and go, well, what does that say to that child that's never on green? What does it say to the child that's always on red? Okay. Does it actually work as an approach or is it you trying to control the situation? And do you, when you kind of look back, because presumably this has been something of a journey um, for your school and I'm, I'm sure that you're still learning. We all are all the time. But do you look back earlier in time and think, gosh, I wish we wouldn't have done things that way? Oh, absolutely completely you know going going back to i remember probably about eight nine years ago now we we sent some of our year six children on a, on a particular trip only those that had got certain behavior oh, wow. it's like oh you just oh and you just you just head in your hands but as i say when i do my, my training to schools you can only go from what you know yeah and you can only go from where you are now yeah. you have to forgive and i say this to parents as well you have to forgive yourself for things that you've done in the past, okay? If, if you now know they weren't the right thing, because we're all on that journey, we're all learning. And as long as we're continuing to do the best that we can, then that's good enough. And I think that is a really important thing, isn't it? Because I think sometimes otherwise we can end up, uh, you know, somebody listening in might be earlier on in this journey and uh, they might look to you and your school as an example and just feel well we're a million miles from that and and how do we do this and we're getting it wrong and i'll be harming the children and i guess every journey starts with a single step right yeah absolutely absolutely i mean one of the biggest steps that we had probably going back many many years now is the taking away of those um, behavior boards where the children had their names and moved up and down you wow. know it was it was i think people felt that well, well what else is there if we don't have that 
what, what, what do we have? And it is, it is about the relationships. You know, it's about a child who's struggling. You have that conversation with them or you, you, you keep them at the end of the lesson. So, oh, do you know, I noticed it was, you, that was really tricky for you today, that lesson. Okay. Yeah. And that's what people need. It's about connection. Yeah. You know, it's that whole analogy, isn't it? Connection before correction. You know, if we haven't got a relationship with someone, there's no way you're going to be able to sort of change and support their behavior. If you don't have a relationship with them, they're just going to be looking at you and going, up yours internally anyway at least well that was my, that was my polite many of the schools response. I've worked with yeah. yeah and did your staff kind of quite willingly come on this journey presumably now you're at a point where you recruit staff who've yeah. got a similar mindset but I mean you must have started with a mixture I mean yeah absolutely I, I think I've always led with with some care and compassion with with the children I've always had yeah. to try to do strong relationships and, and just be nice just yeah. be a nice person and um, yeah, we had staff in the past that didn't get it. Yeah. And even with the support, the training, the coaching, the mentoring, just because of their own potential issues and, mm. and their own headspace, weren't able to adapt enough. Uh, and at that point, in the best interest of the school, they need to move on. Yeah. Because, if, because ultimately it's the children that have to be the priority there. But you're right, I recruit now only those people that have got that um, yeah. In, in their general psyche. And I would tease that out very carefully in interviews. How? Through the questioning, through the challenging. You know, when you ask a question about your, your approach to behavior in the classroom, you know, you know usually the stock answer is around uh, the policy, the school policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you dig deep. Well, what do you feel? What would you, what would you do in these circumstances? You know, what's your natural style? Um, and you, you, you tease it out. You can, you can get that from, um, from an interview with some careful questioning. Do you think you pick it up quite quickly now, whether someone's going to be a kind of good cultural fit? Yes, yeah. yeah, certainly, certainly by halfway through the interview, you've got a sense whether this person is, is matched to your sort of way, way of thinking. And you're also a Timpson Attachment Aware School, right? What does that mean? Yeah, a, a few years ago, um, the Edward Timpson Trust, who does a, does a lot of the trauma-informed school work and attachment awareness, um, they just recognised our school for doing the work um, that we do uh, and just gave us award, uh, an award, award ceremony for the attachment research community uh, wow. that takes place in the West Midlands and beyond. Oh, that's really cool. How did that yeah. feel? Um, it, it's, it's always lovely to get stuff like that. And one of the things that I don't do as a school is is go out for awards and quality marks and, and all that, um, only where it's going to help leadership in terms yeah. of their development. Um, but it was nice. It was nice to sort of get a bit of recognition. And um, it means that the messages that I can give in my training has got a bit more backing that, you know, this has been recognised, that this is an approach that works by a big yeah. national campaign. That's, and it's nice that they, that they, they did recognise they did recognize what you were doing. Did you feel that it was, see, sometimes when I talk to uh, people who've been recognized for what they're doing, there's almost that kind of slight feeling of imposter syndrome. Cause I think oh, sometimes, yeah. yeah, you feel like the more that you know, the more you realize that you're still on a journey, isn't it? And oh, completely, completely. I've, 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 you know, what am I? I'm now into sort of 13 years of headship and I still regularly get imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's cause you're constantly learning. And I think the best sort of people, teachers, leaders are those that keep reflecting on what they're doing. Is this right? What does it mean for the child? What does it mean for the members of staff uh, and the parents and the community? And that's key, I think, to keep learning and keep reflecting. I think that's really important. And I think it is one of the things that enables us to do a good job. But it also it's, it's difficult if you're always challenging yourself like that. You don't ever just want to go, yeah, we're doing all right. <laughs> Yeah, no, my, my, my head space um, is, is very busy. I have a very busy head. And, um, and I think that's what keeps me going a lot of the time. Yeah, I can imagine that it would be a, yeah, would be a, a key driver. I can definitely empathise with that. The imposter syndrome thing, I'm wondering about that in the context of the, the current situation, because um, it's something I've been having a lot of conversations with people about it at the moment and how much people have got that, you know, that back to school in September feeling when everyone gets a bit of imposter syndrome about returning to the chalk face. But right now it feels like that magnified because none of us know what we're doing, do we? Like the future is so uncertain. We're all having to learn how to do new things. We're having to teach in different ways. And yeah, we, we don't know the answers and that's really tough, right? And, and I wondered about how, uh, yeah, what your reflections were on that and what 
how you adapt that in terms of your sort of trauma informed approach and stuff. There's a question in there somewhere, Stuart. Go for there it. is, there is. <laughs> I, I, the back to school for this September is going to be the most challenging that we've, we've ever faced. Um, mm. And having a trauma informed hat on means that we have to do significantly different things yeah. because we know that we're going to have a range of children coming back. Those that have loved, I love being at home, you know, those that have loved being at home that want to come back to school and will continue to love being at school. You know, those that haven't had a great time, those that have learned nothing, those that have learned lots, you know, so a whole range. Um, so what we're doing very carefully, we've completely changed our weekly timetable for September. Okay. So every day starts with either some circle time or a social time, because that's going to be critical to start with, giving yeah. children space and time. What age are your children? Just to... uh, Three to 11. Three to 11. Okay, right. Through, okay. Nursery to year six. Okay. Um, we're ensuring that all lessons to start with are, are very short. Okay. How short? Because that... We're sort of 30 minutes maximum, the same okay. for across the school. But obviously for the, for the early years, it's going to be five, 10 minutes, you know, for the introductions. But, you know, even for the juniors, you know, 30 minutes maximum. Okay. And, and then there's, there's a break or there's some, some sensory activity or another sort of up and down activity, yeah. a, a little break. Um, a lot more outdoor time with, with guaranteeing an outdoor activity daily. Wow. So not just a couple of PE lessons, so whether that's, extended breaks, going for a bike ride, mm -hmm. um, going for a walk, um, doing some outdoor adventure activities, teamwork or PE. So that's a daily, daily outdoor activities for the children as well. Right. Before, before and after dinner, before and after break, it's a transitional activity. Yeah. So, you know, after dinner, they'll come in and do, um, there'll be some music or there'll be a headspace activity or a yeah. mindfulness activity. Yeah, and that's daily because we have to watch those transitions very, very carefully, because mm -hmm. that's where a lot of our children will then struggle. And how do you um, make that work? Because presumably, I mean, is this that your kids have had practice at doing these kinds of activities or are you introducing them now or what? Yeah, there's, there's been certainly been some of those activities that we've done, um, but there'll be a lot more of those. So we're training staff um, in September on those type of activities okay. um, so that they've got an armory, a bit of a toolkit of, of things they can do. Um, we're starting, we've got a couple of days back it, um, in the first week, sort of just settling in. And then the whole the week after is gonna be a wellbeing week. So there's gonna be a whole focus on wellbeing for the children for a whole week. Oh, wow. And then there's gonna be a wellbeing focus every week then for the half term. Wow. And how did you go about putting together your ideas for the return and how it was going to work? Was that a sort of joint process amongst staff or did you come up with it mainly yourself? Or yeah, no, we've, 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 we've asked all staff. And we've also asked the key two, two members of staff that work on our curriculum for us, two classrooms based teachers, yeah. along with the leadership team. And we're saying, you know, what do we think the issues are going to be for our children? Yeah. What do you think they might need more? What does our curriculum need to look like? Yeah. What does the week day need to look like? And we've just put all those ideas into a pot and yeah. we've come up with um, like example weekly plans and timetables and what it might look like for teachers um, in the classroom. And have you involved the kids at all or not at this point? Not at this point, no. Um, we are planning to do a child survey um, in the first few weeks that they're back, asking yeah. them about their experiences, yeah. how they're currently feeling about school. And the idea is to do that regularly. Yes. so that we can pick up those children who we might not typically know yeah. are on our radar. Yeah, and that's one thing I'm, I'm wondering about. I'm kind of curious about how do we know what need we're going to be met with? Because for lots of these kids, we've been really quite out of touch for a little while now. And um, I think people are reporting a range of things, aren't they? Some people are saying kids who are really struggling are actually really thriving at home. Yeah, yeah. Then there is others where there's new needs that we maybe don't know about. And um, what's your, I mean, how are you going to manage that? Yeah, I think the key thing is, is knowledge, isn't it? It's finding out. So we've got our, our pastoral team. So I've got my learning mentors, my assistant head, my family support worker. Yeah. We've been making phone calls throughout the whole of lockdown, yeah. weekly, and some of them daily, oh, to, wow. our key, to our key families. Yeah. We've also had a system where we can identify any family that have gone dark, so they're not engaged in any online learning, or not yeah. responding to any messages, and that triggers a phone call as well. Okay. So we, we know generally which are our key families that have struggled. Yeah. But in August, my pastoral team are currently coming up with an online questionnaire for parents 
So in, oh. at the, in, in August, they will fill that questionnaire in saying, how is your child now? How are they thinking about coming back to school? Yeah. What has been the main challenges for them? Um, and we basically do like a rag rating of yeah. different needs. And they will be given to the teachers in September before the children come back. Yeah. And we'll have, we'll have some information about which children we think might need some additional work. And then the learning mentors and the, the teams will pick all those children up very, very quickly. I see. So you're using the approach that you described was your kind of that's your universal sort of offer, if you like. But you will still have your um, specific additional provision yeah, and intervention. Abs absolutely. The trauma informed practice as a school is, is a universal offer to yeah. all children, you know, because um, it's just nice. It's the right thing to do. And then you've got you, your additional needs then, yeah. which is, you know, those that kids have, have struggled or they don't want to come back to school yeah. or they've had bereavements. And then you obviously get your complex and significant where we're going to have you know, lots and lots of one to one mentoring work yeah. or additional agencies coming into support. And how is this all going to work? I mean, maybe you don't know the detail on this yet. I think we're all figuring it out, aren't we? But how is this going to work like logistically and stuff like what's your school going to look like and who's going to be leading this? Because, yeah, so many questions there, really. But, you know, everybody's going to need to know how to do all the things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Logistically. Yeah. You know, operationally, this is a, a nightmare in yeah. terms of the guidance, in yeah. terms of trying to get the children into different places um, at different times without crossing and all that type of thing. So we, we just keep we're just working on that. I've got a meeting straight after this where we're sort of doing the dinner timetables and, and the, wow. the movement. And, and, you know, it's, it's very operational, um, which which is it needs doing. But. It's not my, not my um, preferred use of my time. Um, <laughs> Although I think it is really important because at the moment, I don't know, I'm having a lot of conversations with people about the things we can control and the things that are beyond our yeah. control. And actually, yeah. these things that you're meeting about, they feel a bit boring, but they are the things we can control, right? And they they're are. the things that we can tell the kids, this is how it works. These yeah. are the rules right now. And yeah. this is our consistency. Absolutely. And, and I think for a lot of children, that structure and routine is yeah. critical in terms of the, the, the return because they then it helps them feel safe. They know what's yeah. going on. They don't need to use as much headspace in terms of knowing where they need to be because it's the same and it's routine. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's getting it as tight as possible in terms yeah. of the organization, but it won't feel like it to the children. They will just get, be guided at the right time to the right place. They won't see the complexities of like the London underground, how things can change yeah. and move. Um, but it will just work, but we've got to get that right. <laughs> I love that. You're like, it will just work. Haven't figured it, it out yet. But it will, it will work. It will. <laughs> I have every faith it will work. Tell me about um, new starters and what is, you know, in, in normal times, if there's ever such a thing, um, what your new starter kind of process is for kids and families and, and how you kind of bring them in. Um, but then also what's that going to look like for your September starters this year who won't have had the normal transition? Absolutely. The tran tra transition is just is so difficult at this stage. You've got the new nursery starters, new reception starters. You've got the year six going to year seven, that transition as well. Um, so I'll start with the year six to seven. So mm -hmm. my, my inclusion leader, my one of my assistant heads, she's been liaising really, really carefully during lockdown with the secondary schools. She's arranged Zoom meetings with the secondary schools with our children. Yeah. Um, so lots of work and conversations and questions children always have the questions they just need answering yeah so it's giving them that opportunity right what questions have you got right let's find, we'll find the answers for you yeah. so that's what we do with year six nursery and reception has been a bit more of a challenge because normally we would invite them in we would do mm. the welcome meetings but we have zoom we have this <laughs> so you know we we're doing um the same meeting i would have normally done in the hall with the parents we're doing it over zoom okay you know we're doing, we're doing the presentation we're doing the question and answers yeah. So that's okay. Um, the nursery and reception teachers are doing one-to-one -one Zoom sessions with the individual parents and yeah. children, so they get to see them. We've put together a video about what the setting looks like. Yeah. We're reading them a story, so they get to see oh. the teacher reading them a story. We're sending them a video. So lots of things like that. And then it's when they start in September, it's about that staggered start. You know, yeah. When they're ready to stay longer, they stay longer. Yeah. they're not quite ready we're not going to force it you know it's that relaxed approach and is your prediction that children will be more or less school ready than usual this year 
I don't think there's one answer there because I think it depends on the individual child. I think from, from the 90 odd kids that we've got back at the moment, yeah. that they're loving it. They're, 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 they're glad to be back. And even though it's different, the classroom's different and the, the learning's a bit different, they're glad to be in school. So I think because of the type of school we are, Mm. I think the overwhelming majority are going to rush into school in September. They're going to want to connect back with us and tell us everything that's been going on, whether that's good, bad, indifferent, you know, yeah. they will want to tell us just because that's the type of school that we, we have. Um, we've just got to be ready. We've just got to be ready for those ones that are school refusing um, for those that are, are going to struggle being in the classroom for that period of time. Mm. But we know that that's going to be the issues. So I think if you're prepared for it and you've thought about as many different scenarios as you can yeah. and then go, right, if this happens, what are we going to do? Yeah. Okay. Because then teachers aren't going to have, what do I do? If yeah. this is facing me in the classroom, they're going to know what to do. So you're doing a huge amount of kind of planning and preparation for, for September. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, so you're a trauma-informed school and this seems amazing for the children and they're delighted to be there. And it must be, I'm sure, in so many ways, a really lovely place to work, but it does sound like a lot of work. I mean, what does this mean for your staff and what's their well-being like? And does the trauma-informed approach extend to kind of them and their well-being too? Absolutely. I think staff well-being is, is critical because if, if staff aren't regulated, if staff aren't in a good place, that's just going to translate to 30 children in the glass mm -hmm. and that's, that's not going to end well. So we have a very, very clear, open door communication with me. They can want to talk to me directly, but we have a structure where they've always got somebody they can talk to. Okay. Um, and that includes a, a mental health first aider for staff. Yeah. Um, we've got a well-being member of staff as well who keeps us all jolly and um, mm -hmm. is always there sending little messages out to making sure staff know they can go to somebody. We've got the Headspace app, for example, for all members of staff. So they've got some sort of mindfulness and meditation for themselves and we're organizing group um not group therapy it was group supervision yeah staff. oh you are okay tell me yeah. more about that why are you doing that because it, first of all for anyone who doesn't know yeah so supervision is a way we get um, an external person it can be internal person but we're going for an external person who is there to listen to talk mm -hmm. to staff um for them to be able to confidently talk um about any issues that are going on for them uh, and for that for that that person the person doing the supervision to sort of tease out what the issues might be um, and for that person to come up with some of the solutions themselves so and we, we, we do supervision for our safeguarding leads but yeah. this will be extended now to, to group supervision for the year groups or phases uh, and then if anybody wants individual supervision then that will be also available to them and you're investing in someone external coming in and doing that yeah. so you've made a, an active decision this is something you're going to prioritize in your budget yeah why did you do that because if you can't look after your staff it will impact on your children and ultimately if, if it's not happy in the classroom that's going to cause more behavior issues lack of learning lack of results you know if you, you just it just starts off a whole tumbleweed of of issues if you don't have staff in the good in the right place yeah so it's an investment and a sausage sandwich always goes down well as well <laughs> yeah i have to say of all the training i deliver anything which has either like scones or bacon butties or something along those lines usually those sessions go better and it's nothing to do with my training <laughs> it's, it's the sausage sandwiches definitely sausage sandwiches are great um i'll come train in your school if there's sausage sandwiches <laughs> um so okay so your your staff are supported through through the the supervision and and the in terms of moving up from uh supervision for just a few members of staff to then looking to to roll that out more widely is that because you saw success from the individual supervision or is this just a kind of natural direction you were going i think there is a requirement really for supervision for safeguarding leads yeah and i think that recognizes that they're dealing with very difficult situations yeah. Now, if we translate this to September, all members of staff are going to be dealing with difficult situations yeah. and therefore they need to have an outlet. Yeah. You know, and you've got to remember so, some members of staff will have a partner who's really good at listening. Mm -hmm. Some members of staff will live on their own. 
or, or not be able to have that sort of conversation outside of the workplace. Yeah. So, you know, I think we've got a duty of care for the staff to make sure there's something in place for them. I see. So it's a response specifically really to the situation. Do you think you would continue with it beyond? I think it would be um, assessing the benefit of it for the individual members of staff. So if, remember, if, if staff, when we get feedback from it, say, Do you know, this is really useful as a general teaching yeah. career, you know, the pressures of teaching, um, can we carry it on? Then we'll look into that definitely. How will you measure the impact of it? Like, how, you know, if I spoke to you in 12 months time and said, Stuart, you invested X amount of your budget into supervision 12 months ago. Um, has it been a worthwhile investment? What would you be telling me? How would you show me that it was worthwhile? I think there's a, there's a couple of things. There's the staff wellbeing checks, well, wellbeing yeah. surveys. You know, we've done those in the past. We're just, how are things going for you? How's communication in the school? How's, you know, um, work-life balance, all that. Um, and wellbeing is always one of those questions. Yeah. Uh, but also you could also look at things like staff absence, sickness rates, you know, all those type of measures as well, if you wanted to, um, to explore it a little bit more. And I can't have this whole conversation with you without going and thinking a little bit about Ofsted. So I work with lots of schools um, who aspire to be more like uh, a school like yours and often one of the things that they say is you know well it, it feels like the right thing to do and particularly right now while we're thinking about our response to the pandemic we want to take this much more nurturing and caring approach and it's the right thing to do for the children but are we going to get our knuckles wrapped x months down the line by Ofsted when they say why are you doing this I mean what, what what's Ofsted take on what you're doing because you've been doing it a while well, yeah, well, going back sort of nine, 10 years, we were requires improvement as a school, you know, we, and that was part of the journey where we'd started doing a lot of this work. Um, and then at the next inspection, we were good overall with outstanding leadership and management and outstanding behaviour and safety. What, how, so, what time, what time period was between those two judgments? Uh, two years. Crikey. That's impressive. Yeah. And was it like, you know, was that a judgment? Did you feel that both of those judgments were fair reflections of where the school was at the time? I think the requires improvement one was, at the time, was we felt hard done by. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a natural response to criticism. And on um, reflection? On reflection, when you look back now, uh, it was probably one of the best things that could have happened because it gave us a, a kickstart to do some things we wanted to do and make changes we needed to make. Um, so, yeah, um, and we had another inspection uh, last year. And again, very, very strong. The same sort of comments, the, the caring approach came out very strong in our report. And, you know, the, down to the ch children said they always had somebody to go to if they needed to talk. Wow. You know, and it's things like that that are just are critical to us. So Ofsted are not only, if I'm interpreting what you're saying, they're not only not having an issue with what you're doing but they're actually picking it out as a as a real strength uh in their absolutely like, because it is a strength and i think i think that's the thing this isn't some sort of you know quirky that's just an idea this is mm -hmm. based in neuroscience you yeah. know trauma is there we can't deny that this is in place and we can't deny the issues that happens as a result of this yeah. um so yes, it works because it's the right thing to do. And it's just a nicer place to be. If, yeah. if, you're, in a, if you're working in a school and, and, and being educated in a school where yeah. the staff talk to you nicely, care for you, pick up when you're feeling wobbly, nurture you, then what, what, what's, what's to argue with that? Yeah, you sell it pretty persuasively. So people at the moment, I mean, obviously this moment in time is a massive cause for reflection for many people and I think that there will be many um, leaders and more general school staff out there who are thinking actually maybe this is the time to make a bit of a change and maybe they are doing a little bit of some of the things you've mentioned already or maybe they're not but they might think that this might help them and their community as we look to you know more widely reopen in September. If someone's kind of you know they're ready for that change. Where do you start? Like, what are the first things you need to do? What do you need to think about? Like, how do you get going on that journey? What did you do to start with? The knowledge, that was the biggest thing. Okay. Um, you know, under, understanding why children behave in certain ways and, and what's underlying that. And, and once you have that knowledge, you go, oh, okay, I see why they did that. Right, now how am I gonna help them? Yeah. Now, how am I gonna control them? or punish them, 
or you know how am I going to help them with this situation and I think that's the starting point for anyone learn learn about trauma learn about disassociation learn about attachment learn about sensory processing dysregulation you know all of the key things to do with um, developmental trauma um, and the impact once you know that you then think okay what do I now need to do how does my practice need to change how do I need to change when I'm talking to that child Um, because it isn't about I need to win as the as the adult because I'm in control. Mm-hmm. You know, we, it's a long. This is a long game. This isn't about quick fixes for children. Yeah. This is about making sure that when they're an adult, you've done everything you can to make sure they can they can function really well and have the, the toolkits available and to cope with with life. And so that's quite a big ask, isn't it? Like le- le- learn all the things and then and then do them, which <laughs> is. How, like do you have any like sp- you obviously you go out and you train on this i mean do you have sort of specific recommendations of good you know what would you recommend if someone needed to go and buy a book or access a website or go to some i, I don't know what where would they start like oh my god there's so many many you you've got dan hughes daniel siegel um you've got sally donovan you've got loads loads of authors like this um that have got really good trauma informed but adoption uk books are really good you know, the tra- trauma-informed schools book, that's a, a great little read. Um, just choose a book around trauma-informed schools that's been published in the last few years or yeah. has got highly recommended. Just read it. Because See, I a love, lot of them. Um, it- sorry, I was to say, I love the power of showing up, um, which is really aimed at parents, isn't it? But I think that's one of the most basic but really easy to apply kind of frameworks that I've read for a really yeah. long time. And that's, that's Daniel Siegel, isn't it? And, and yeah. Uh, yeah, Tina Payne Bryce. And I think if, if you really just want a very, very quick read, go into any Timson shops. They do the little books of attachment that are free of charge. You walk in yeah. and you get it, you know, yeah. get your keys cut while you're there. Um, <laughs> and it's a great little read. It'll take you five minutes to read it. But it's some of the key principles, you go, ah, oh, okay. So, okay. So you don't need like a PhD in neuroscience in no, order to No, 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 no. Absolutely not, you know. When you can talk about, you know, the amygdala and, and you know, and, and all the different parts of the brain and hippocampus and it can calm you and amygdala and it fires, you know, and that's interesting, but you don't need to know that. It helps, I think, because yeah. you realise it's actually, it's, it's in, in the body that's having these reactions. Yeah. But just, just choose a book, read it, and it's got, you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. So I either got, do uh, an online training course yeah, you know, I know, I, know uh, I think Adoption UK do one. Pack UK do an online attachment training course, which is only a few quid. Um, or, or get your school if it's a school trained. At least have a day where you it's a starting point. That does not mean you have a training day. Oh, good, you're trauma informed. Yeah, this is a you know. I think some people think that. Oh, yes, we've had the training. Yeah. No, that's just that's just one element of of a broader, longer game. But you've got to start somewhere. Get the information. Get the knowledge. I think when it comes to training, sometimes we think that, you know, we can turn up and we can do a day of training and then we're done. And I feel actually with a lot of this kind of practice that you're talking about here, that's exactly the wrong approach. And you might need it to kickstart stuff. But for me, often, I think that, you know, literally five minutes here and half an hour there. And, oh, here's a book recommendation. You know, it's it's drip feeding, isn't it? I think that. So I think, the, I don't know, maybe you disagree with this, but I think it's about getting the chance to practice it and see how it works. Oh, yeah, it? yeah. Absolutely. You've got to, you've got to practice it. You've, it's got to be, it's got to change your, your heart and mind to start with. Yeah. And yeah. then you've got to build on that. Yeah. You know, you need that initial, oh, oh, that's why this child's like this. Or, oh, that's, oh, that's just, that's a child in my class. That's exactly what they do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and it's those little changes. And I say it in the training, right. What is it you're now going to do different for that child? You know, that child in your class, make a difference to them today, tomorrow, this week. And it's through those little changes, then you get a massive change within your school. Yeah. So it's lots of it's yeah, it's not about just changing the policy. Actually, it's about lots and lots and lots and lots of tiny things. And if someone was looking, you know, we're we're time poor, like, you know, if someone said, look, I I want to do this, I want to get started. I'm not quite sure where to start. I've only got so much time I can spend on it. What are my priorities? Where would you start? What, what, you know, 
policies, training? Big, big question. Yeah. I don't think you, you can't start with policies. Okay. Because the, the danger is if that somebody with the knowledge puts the policies in and then the staff don't understand the rationale behind that policy, then it won't be implemented. Uh -huh, it'll just uh -huh. fall, it'll fall flat. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's some, some basic knowledge. And I think this is a great opportunity to do it. And staff will have most of that knowledge in their own heads. So one of the things that we're going to do as part of our inset in September is, is say to staff, okay, what potential issues might we find our children having yeah. when they come back? Just allow that conversation. Because you'll realise then suddenly there is a whole page full of potential issues. Yeah. And just by giving time to reflect on that, then it's going into your psyche. Okay, we might have issues. Okay, so how are we going to deal with these? Let's take one at a time. Yeah. What might this look like for the child? And what might our response be when we get that situation? It's just small bits, you know. A child struggling to sit still in the class because they've not had to sit still for the next. So what, what do we need to do? Well, let's let's make it so they don't have to. Yeah. So let's keep the session short. But if we see them fidgeting, then either as a whole class, we stop and have a break. Yeah. Or that child, we get them to go and do a job. We move around. Oh, James, can you just come and give these books out for me? You know, yeah. knowing that the different tolerances for the need for movement, for example, just as one thing will be different across the whole class. Yeah. And just, just knowing that, knowing that every, every child would have a different sensory profile yeah. and you've got to be picking up on those. It's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot to... to... It is, but this is what teachers do. This is what they're trained to do in terms of managing classrooms. Yeah. If you've got the mindset that every child needs to be the same, mm. then you're going to have a struggle as a teacher. If you look at individual... You, you do individual needs for, for maths, for phonics, for, for every other aspect of learning. Yeah. So we just have to see this as just another another element of learning. Yeah, I see. And so actually you're you're kind of talking to really uh, just a more in, intuitive, like actually trusting ourselves a little bit more maybe yeah. to, to take a more kind of care-based approach to all that we're doing in the classroom. Absolutely. But that becomes, that's a leadership thing as well though, because you need to make sure your staff know they can do those things. Yeah, I was going to say. The worst thing you can have yeah. is staff thinking, oh, no, I've got to get through this work. I've, I've got to do 40 minutes because then, everyone gets anxious yeah and that's that's hard isn't it and also what about all the stuff around the restrictions around hutch and that sort of thing at the moment and particularly i mean it's always a, a bit of a challenge isn't it with safeguarding and things but what 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 are your kind of thoughts on that well from from september well, it's, it's pretty much within your bubble yeah it's pretty much back to normal for the children mm. you know the guidance is still saying staff where they where they can should try to stay away yeah. um but I, I mean, I've seen over the last few weeks, staff are, are, are gradually then getting closer and closer to those children. The hugs are starting to get a bit coming back. Yeah. You know, it, it's a challenge. It's difficult. But you, when, we're lucky where we are at the moment in Birmingham. The, the, the transmission rate is really low at the moment. Mm. Um, but I think where it's, if it spikes again, then it's going to be more difficult. We'll have to put more restrictions back in place. So I guess it's like everything, isn't it? We're just trying to yeah take calculated risks and actually the children's well-being and making sure that they're going to grow into strong little people is uh, yeah. maybe the more important thing but i think we've just got to make sure that the back to school is, is as fun as it can yeah. be you know so it's not high pressure you know it's not high stakes that's got to come from the top hasn't it oh absolutely you know and i will i mean i've been doing zoom lessons every week with the children you know every, every year group has been having a zoom lesson from me you know, and a lot of it is about fun. I want to see them laugh. Uh, I don't want to see them. I don't want to see them like this. I want. Yeah. I want to see I want giggles. You know, it's it's good. Get get the good. How do you make going. them laugh? I just tell them jokes. <laughs> do you talk to them about penguins? What is your thing with penguins? Oh, I do you know. I've, I just absolutely adore penguins. So I just think they're the most. Look at your face light up. I say there were penguins, and you've gone. I love off penguins. I love penguins. I, tra I travel around the country, seeing as many penguins as I can. So. I, I just, that. I just love them. That's a it's whole other podcast, isn't it? I, like it completely. Penguins, yeah, I love it. Um, I just, I have one more question from me, and then we're going to do our quick fire Q and A from the millions of people who've sent stuff in. My okay. last question was about if someone's listening to this, like so much of what you said, it's really evident that a trauma informed approach has got to be led from the top. What if I'm listening to this podcast and I'm a school nurse or a teaching assistant or a classroom teacher without any responsibilities in terms of leadership can I make a difference 
absolutely you can make a difference to the children that you work with directly okay. you know and, and the the aces movement is very clear that having one strong connected adult in that children's life can make the difference for that child okay so if you're working with those key children even if the school isn't trauma informed and doing some of the right things you can still make a huge difference to that life of that child and, okay. and, and we know that when you, you look at celebrities that have been reflected on their time they will always go back to that one teacher that showed them care compassion time yeah you know that's that's what we can give to, to the children that need it and that's what you can do anyone in a school can do that whether that's a support assistant a nurse a secretary it can be anyone that can do that and if one found oneself in that position where you felt like you want to do this and you want to make this difference but you're in a school where that doesn't feel like the the sort of general culture and ethos do you think that it's better like would you recommend that person stays in that school and tries to impact on the children that's kind of within their reach to impact on or would they have more impact by actually saying maybe this isn't the right fit for me culturally and i should move somewhere like your school where i'll be more well received I think if you can instigate change, brilliant. So if you can get an ally on the senior leadership team, yeah. and if you, even if it's, oh, I've, I've, I've read this really, really useful article. I wondered if you might want to read it. You know, yeah. if you can influence some change, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Okay, do it. I think if it's directly affecting your own well-being yeah. as an adult, because they don't get it and I'm trying to do this and they just don't get it, yeah. then it's maybe time to move on because... Yeah. You, you've got to look after yourself as well yeah yeah and that's i think that's a really important thing to remember isn't it we can and i think particularly the the sorts of people who really really care often that care is is all about the children and not enough about ourselves and actually we matter as well don't we absolutely okay we've got loads of questions so we're going to go we'll, we'll do these sort of fairly quick fire um hey. and uh you'll you've got all the answers of course right <laughs> <laughs> let's see shall we Okay, so um, how can we support children who were a lot happier at home than they've ever been at school? Oh, I de absolutely. I think the, the key thing on there is why were they not happy in school in the first place? Okay, it, it's, there's the two parts of that question. They might be happier at home, but were they also happy at school? Okay. okay? If they weren't happy in school, then you had, that's, the issue was already there. So what was the issue in school? Was it was relationships? Was it friendships? Was it, you know, special needs? What is it? So I think it's about making sure that return to school is as stress-free yeah. and relaxed and fun as possible while keeping the structure there because that's what's going to be needed. Difficult one, that. Yeah, that is a tricky one, isn't it? But, but it comes back to what you've said a couple of times, really, about just being curious, really, isn't it? What, yeah. Why? Why? And let's pick it yeah. up. Um, what kinds of activities would you suggest to ease the transition back into school for very anxious pupils or those with previous trauma experience? Okay. I think the transition starts way before September. You know, it starts with, with conversations and connections uh, now. Mm -hmm. What are you looking forward to? What are you worried about? You know, doing that whole, I, I tend to do the sort of scale of, of one to 10. So, you know, um, how are you feeling about the first day on a scale of one to 10? You know, um, where one's, one's ooh, horrible, 10's great, or whichever way around you want to do it. Okay, if, okay, if, it's, if you're saying it's a seven, where that's, well, that's quite a wobbler, that's quite worrying, what would help make it to five? Yeah. What would make it go down? And they go, well, actually, I, want, I don't know whether my friend's going to be there. Okay, right. Let's find that out. Okay. Can, can, I, can I still bring my, my water bottle? Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Okay. Now, how do you feel? Five. Okay. Still a bit high. How, it's that conversation. It, it's, it's giving them time and space to identify their worries and, and work, work through them. And I think you, you mentioned before, didn't you, that we, we need to find out from the children what their actual worries are, because we can guess and we can have a bit of an idea about some of those kind of themes. But it will be those little things are the things that often yeah. really prey on little minds. And to them, they're the really big things. Right. And we can often quite easily help them work their way around that, can't we? Absolutely. And, and it's, it's those worries that belong to them that are their worries. It's worries that are broader than them, that are other people's worries. You know, things like the huge bag of worries, the book. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You, you can use resources clearly now and over the summer. We've got our family support worker and our inclusion team, 
and our helpline number all in operation over the summer holidays. Wow. So people can still get in touch with us. That's amazing. Are you guys getting a break? Yeah, we're, we're, we're staggering it and um, we're making sure people are still getting a break. But there's a few key people that will still be working over the summer. Will too. you get a break? I will make sure I get a break, but I will be still. I can't. I, I find it very hard to switch off anyway. But yeah. there will definitely be times where I do switch off. It's hard though, that isn't it? See, I, I find myself talking a lot to my team about the need for them to look after their own well-being and have downtime, and that's often an email I've sent at half past four in the morning. And uh, we need to lead it a little bit as well, live it as well as just. You know, it's I think it depends on what you know. My, my brain is a very busy brain, and my, you know, so sometimes doing stuff is actually better than not doing stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And these are like really unusual times, I think, they as are. well. Um, it's just that they're unusual times that are going on quite a long time as well. And it's, it's balancing that, isn't it? It's tough. Um, how to support a child who has become looked after, so for anyone uh, international that's uh, gone into foster care, probably, um, during lockdown, who has not accessed school at all due to the distance getting them to school? And I think this is going to be a, a key thing in terms of safeguarding um, and, and you know there will be unfortunately some children that have gone into care at this point that is where your your learning mentors or your external services um, will kick in very very quickly on day one because yeah. if you leave it to day three then potentially they're going to have exploded or gone really really into themselves yeah. you know you, if you see if you see kids disassociating and, and you know shutting down then we've got to be we've got to be on to that. So there would be there would be phone calls over the summer. There'd be phone calls the day before. Yeah. You know there would be meeting them on the gate in the morning, yeah. bringing them straight in if they wanted to talk before going into class. Yeah. You know lots of opportunities. So lots of really careful planning, I guess, and yeah. really careful planning. Um, and then I guess this one leads on from that a little bit. So how do we, an outside agency supporting children and families, help you, the school, ensure children and young people are ready to re return in September? What do you need from us over the summer? And what sort of agency it is, really. I mean, if it's an agency that's currently working with those children, you know, I'd, I'd want them to keep connecting with them. You know, however, if it's every month or whatever it might be, um, so those children know that these people are still there yeah. because, you know, if they have built connections with them and then they suddenly haven't heard from them for three months, you know, what, you don't know what that child is thinking. Mm. Have, have they had, have they had it? Are they still alive? Are they still, are they still working? You know, and those thoughts can consume a child. Yeah. Um, and we might not know those thoughts unless we're asking them. Yeah. So yeah, I'd just say, keep the connection going um, for schools any resources, any little tidbits of reading, any book recommendations, yeah. classroom activities, all of those things are going to help. And some agencies might be in a position to kind of um, alert the school to children who are a cause for concern who might not previously have been, presumably. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if there's any sort of agencies that are working with families that we don't know about, yeah. you know, I would, you know, as a matter of course, expect them to, to have been in touch yeah. and to explain the situation. Okay. Um, should behaviour policies change to reflect the anxiety some children may be feeling? I would hope the behaviour policy was already doing that. That would be my ideal. Okay. Um, but but it, yeah, if, if it doesn't, if it doesn't also reflect that children will have difficulties anyway, and you have to have certain individual approaches to certain children, then it should, as a matter of course. So it may need some, you know, tweaks regarding, you know, the COVID specific elements, mm -hmm. you know, not washing hands, coughing, touching, you know, that type of element. Yeah. But for me, it still comes back to the original outcome. If they're doing that, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, you, you've talked really um, clearly about the, the, the policy it matters, but what matters more is the practice, isn't it? So, um, what should or could we expect schools to offer across the summer to prepare children and young people to return? Uh, and then slightly more uh, tricky question, has the government funding actually made any difference? Um, government funding, okay. <laughs> we don't know how much we're getting. Okay. 
So there's this whole thing about this, this extra catch up funding and things. I um, still don't know how much we're getting. So the guidance last week suggested that we could use the money for summer activities. So what does that mean? summer activities you can do like clubs and activities, well-being activities over the summer if you wanted to, mm -hmm. legitimate use of this, this money. Yeah. But we don't know how much we're getting yet. Okay. And, and how will they target how it's spent and stuff? Like, do you, yeah. Okay. No idea. We've not got any detail on that as yet. Um, it would be useful to know. Um, because it gives us a sense on, you know, can we afford to, to bring in an extra um, support worker or an extra mentor to, you know, to, to divvy up the caseload a little bit in September? Uh, we don't know. It's been passed on to, for us. It's been passed on to the local authority and we're just waiting on, on news on how much it is and, and when we're going to get it. What would you like to be doing? What would you use a bit of extra cash for over the summer that would have a big impact? Over the summer? Um, Nothing, nothing more than what we were doing, which is checking in with our key families um, for the summer because the children need a break. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and the reason we're doing, we're doing a parents' evening um, the week after next. Yeah. Um, outside, you know, social distance and all that. But we're giving all the children and parents a chance to one to one with their current teachers to end the year. Oh, great! And that is crucial because this is just it's just all blurred, mm. half term blurred, Easter blurred. And if we, we, we were in danger of the summer holidays becoming a blur as well and some people carrying on with home learning and all that, you know, we need that distinctive mark for the children. This is the end of the year. This is our goodbyes for this year. And in September, you'll start with your new teacher. And, and for us, that was the goodbyes is, is critical. Do you think a legitimate use of some money over the summer would be, you talked about how much you think your kids need to laugh right now, like, could you, I don't know, use it to make them happy? I don't know, that sounds like a big... It, it is, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? And I think I'm hoping um, that the summer holidays, the children will be able to get out more yeah. and do more normal stuff. Yeah. Um, I think it's tricky. I think we, it's, it's going to be mainly picking up in September. Yeah. Um, for us anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't think the, the, the benefit for over the summer will we'll do any more than what we're currently doing no but it's that kind of family outreach work really that's that's going to be crucial yeah Our family you, support worker will continue working over yeah. the summer yeah i mean and and that's the thing yeah your, your family support workers in the schools that i i work with often they are oh just absolutely golden members of your team aren't they 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 make such a difference we'll do a last couple i'm really aware of time you've got to go work out how on earth you're going to make your school work um how can schools support staff well-being their self-care should be a priority to enable them to support young people and their families you probably already talked to this a little bit but what would be your you know if you're going to do one thing take the pressure off in terms of what you're asking them to do so you know but, but that's general as well. So think about what planning you're asking for. You know, what, what are you asking them to submit? What are you asking them to write? What are you asking them to plan? Give them as many resources as you can to support their, their delivery. And I think, to be honest, the whole lockdown has given us an opportunity to think about how we do deliver and teach because there's suddenly all of this online delivery, national stuff, yeah. that is really good. Yeah. No, yeah. so, so actually, sometimes in planning, it can be, right, we're going to watch a five-minute clip about this topic, and I'm now going to facilitate the learning rather than me delivering, planning, doing the pre presentation. It's a lot of this just done now. So why not use that and say it's okay to use that? Because it's good stuff. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't ask for weekly plans to be given. No, they plan on their presentations, and they deliver it. That's the planning. You know, it, it's stuff that schools can do. Just take the pressure and the accountability. So you're, taking, you're taking that radical step of actually trusting your practitioners to be able to do That's, their jobs. Goodness me, the, the amount of amazing creative stuff that I've seen in the home learning from my staff over the past sort of three months yeah. is fantastic. And it's just embedded the fact that you've got to trust your practitioners. Yeah. That they're, they're, they're amazing. Just let them, let them loose, let them do stuff. 
And, and that's been a really nice outcome, isn't it? I know that there's been, yeah, there, there's been good and bad and there's been real challenge about the current situation, but there are some people who've just really flown. I've got um, a uh, lady coming up in a couple of weeks time who has just done the most amazingly um, sort of creative ways of approaching work with her kids. And they've been creating all their, their stuff from home. And it's just one of those where she's just, she's obviously just someone who's really creative and the kids have just yeah. really got on board with it and the families have enjoyed it too. And, I think, yeah. yeah, it's just lovely. And I think she's probably someone that in, in normal times would have just been kind of quietly getting on with that. But because of how things are right now, like actually it's, you know, gained a bit of momentum and lots of people are using yeah. it. I'm going to finish with this uh, question. Um, I'm seeing a lot of edu Twitter criticism, fancy that, of the focus on trauma and schools arguing that we should just return to business as usual. What would you say to them? I think for many children, getting back to business as usual would be the best thing for them. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be a significant number of children that, that is not going to work for. It's like any approach. There's not one approach that will suit all children. You know, so if you're a school that are pretty much going back to normal in September, yeah. fine. But what are you doing for those that are not going to cope with that? If they have got other rooms or other curriculum that those children can do that can't manage, then go for it. You know, we're going from the other end. We're making it, you know, more free and focused in terms of small bursts for all children. And then we'll gradually increase it from that way. And we're not, we're not saying we're going to do that after a half term, after a week, after two weeks. We're just seeing how it is week by week. And saying, yeah. okay, and reviewing, where are we now? Can this class cope with this? Can this year group cope with this? What do they need next? Um, but each school will do it in their own way. For some children, going back to that normality and as much structure as possible and routine is, might, might be the best thing for them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually being led by the, by the, the need that's there. Yeah. Yeah. What thought would you like to leave people with who've, who've listened to this? Listen to the children. Don't think that the adults have the answers because our minds are very different. We don't know the individual experiences of all these children. So take time, create time to listen, be curious, and make sure you have a big smile on your face in September and that they think that you have missed them dearly and you are so glad they are back because they're going to crave the connection. Even if they push that away very quickly, they're still going to need it. Oh, I've gone all a bit emotional at that. That, that. Wow. I think we end there. I'm going to press stop. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute joy having you on today. Thank and, you very uh, much. I hope you'll come back. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. Take care.